Hi everyone. Um, in this next of talk, next talk we are, we are having Shina Akona. She is going to talk about um, Apache Airflow at Umazi. She works for uh, Umazi. So let's welcome Shina. Hey everyone. Who likes XKCD? Awesome, awesome. This comic is especially relevant to my life and maybe to yours too, which might be why you're here. Uh, I'll give you a moment. Are you done? <laughs> awesome, <laughs> one person's done, sweet. <laughs> okay, cool, so I'm here to talk to you about Apache Airflow at umuzi.org. So I work for Umuzi. Um, we, we have nice t-shirts um, and we work in education. So um, basically, before I talk about <laughs> Airflow, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I do and um, kind of my mission. So basically, Umuzi is a place where we do tech learnerships. So we, we have a pretty robust talent pipeline and our number one metric, like our key metric that we optimize for constantly is the number of people we can place in high value careers. So in order to do that, we do a bunch of different things. Um, we, we teach people, but first we need to select the right people to teach. So we have an online test that that a whole lot of many, many, many people fill out. So like thousands of people every time we have an intake, which is quite cool. Um, and then we take the upper crust of those people and then we interview them in human form. Um, and then we take the upper crust of that and we put them through a, sh a short boot camp. And then we take the upper crust of that and we put them through a learnership. Um, they get a qualification at the end of the day and they get a job at the end of the day um, and a high value career as well. So a couple of my students are around here. Shout guys. Woo. Woo. <laughs> yeah. So um, those guys are in this pipeline and they've made it through into the learnership, which is cool. Um, one thing that we have, well, we're growing really, really fast. So I started working there in January this year and we've doubled in size. We're gonna do it again in a little while. So it's intense and it's awesome and it's cool, um, but it also means we have some teething problems because we've got, this, we've got this amazing talent pipeline, like a pipeline for people, but we need a pipeline for our data as well and it, need, and it needs to be like suitably robust because without that, like, it's very hard. Um, and we're based in JP's town, and this is the end of my shameless plug, we're hiring, so yeah. <laughs> um, cool, so who am I, and why do I get to talk about this? My name's Sheena, and I'm the CTO of Amuzi. I've been coding for a long time, like since high school, so it's been a while, um, and I really, really dig Python. It's my main thing, but um, do some other stuff as well. Um, so that's who I am, and that's why I get to talk about this. So, Umuzi prides itself on being a data-driven organization. Um, originally, the data came from outside. So the data came from um, external organizations and their needs and their requirements, which informed the kinds of syllabuses that were created within Umuzi. But now we've got a lot of data that comes out of our internal processes. Um, so our biggest thing, our biggest source of data is our recruitment funnel. Um, so that's kind of, where I'll focus most of this talk. Um, but Umuzi isn't the only data-driven organization around. There are many others. Um, for example, Airbnb. Heard of those guys? Maybe some of you are staying in Airbnbs for your stay here in Joburg. Yeah. So, like, we're growing fast, and it's great, but it's got a lot of problems. Um, like, it's not, they're nice problems to have, but they're not problems unique to our space. So in general, as a data-driven organization is quite small, like when they're just starting out, um, maybe there's a little bit of automation that needs to be built. Um, maybe there's, there are some like Python scripts, a little bit of pandas over here, some bash over there, a little bit of cron over there. Um, and it gets quite, quite difficult as, as you grow. So, as you grow, you need more and more tools, right? You need more and more um, integrations of different data sources, which is a big deal. Um, and then you end up having all these data flows that interact with each other and rely on each other in different ways, and that gets really hideous if you're managing it with cron. Um, 
interdependencies are, like, they need to be dealt with. Um, you need to be able to make something that, like, data pipelines that can rely on other data pipelines, and that's not always a trivial thing. Um, you need things to run on specific schedules, so also, like, cron's great, like, it's a fantastic tool, but eventually it's just not enough. Um, and then, of course, stakeholder requirements grow and they shift. So with us and our talent pipelines, we have to perform, we have to deliver, we have to make really, really good, good decisions because our system of education is kind of an alternative system. Um, and so in order for us to perform our mission, we have to do a freaking good job so we can maintain the trust of industry. Um, so if we make bad selections because our data pipelines are crappy, um, then that's no good. If we are slow to um, satisfy the talent needs of our corporate sponsors, then that's also really awful. And so, yeah, that all happens. And it's quite difficult to, to deal with without a dedicated tool. So generally what ends up happening for a while at least is you, you have all your scripts and they're stuck together with some sticky tape and bits of string and like it kind of works, but you need somebody senior to run it because it's magical and convoluted. Um, and so, this is kind of normal. Um, and as these pipeline requirements grow, you end up needing a whole lot of extra stuff on top of that. So eventually you want to monitor these things, right? Um, you want to be able to handle retries. So for example, our data pipelines require external data from time to time. Um, sometimes that data is not available, and so you don't want everything to just break and fall over if, if it's not there. Um, you need your code to be maintainable. So if you've just got like lots of people working on their own little tools and then somebody tying it together, it gets very, very messy. Um, ideally, you'd want as much as possible to be, like you'd want it to be consistent. Um, you'd want it to be dry as well because repetition is oh, just a, a monster. Um, yeah, scale's a big deal as well. So in terms of scale, I mean a lot of different things. Scale of the, the code base itself, like you want it to grow without falling over. Um, scale as in computing resources as well. So um, our data isn't gigantic. Um, like we have thousands and thousands of people applying, but I mean it's just thousands, whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so like our, our data isn't that big, but you do want something that can scale to be big. Um, you might also want to be able to scale your resources because you have different compute loads. So um, maybe you want to um, do some stuff with PySpark. That's okay. Maybe you want to do, like, maybe you have a Hadoop cluster over there that does something else. That's all right as well. Um, so you want to be able to allow your data pipelines to deal with different kinds of workloads. So that's another aspect of scale. On top of that, you want to be able to troubleshoot this thing. So that kind of ties into monitoring. Um, if you can't see what's up, if you can't like test out individual little pieces in a standalone way, it, it's just really difficult. Um, and then, of course, authorization and authentication become important as well. So if you're dealing with people's private information, that's a big deal. If your compute resource, resources are expensive, you don't want to just let anybody press the play button. Um, SLAs become important as well. So again, for, for Umuzi, like we, we don't really have to do SLAs on our, on our data pipelines. Like if it takes two days, it's okay, because we do a recruitment round like every couple of months, so it's all right. Um, it doesn't take us two days. But um, if you take the case of somebody like Airbnb, their data pipelines output kind of, it, it has to be accessible to a client's device, you know? So, so their users are interacting with the data that comes out of these things. So it has to be fast enough and it has to be um, like correct enough for their users. And you want to have a way of just maintaining this and monitoring it and making sure that it happens. Um, and there's even more. Um, there, yeah, there are so many needs that you end up having as, as you grow as a, as a data-driven organization. Yeah. So that's a whole lot of needs, like a whole lot of needs. And Apache Airflow kind of, it aims to solve all those problems, which is really, really cool. Um, feels like cheat codes using it, um, so that's nice. So what is it? Basically, um, Airbnb, I keep mentioning them because they invented this thing, and they were kind enough to uh, donate it to the Apache Foundation. It is now an Apache top-level project. 
And what that means is that it's robust, it's really, really solid, like it just works, it just works. Um, and it's also, um, it's got a fantastic community behind it. It's really, really robust, lots of really good documentation, and it's pretty intuitive as well for the most part. Um, so we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the website says it's a platform to programmatically author, schedule, and monitor workflows. So cool, uh, what does that mean? Um, so, in order to understand what Apache Airflow really does, um, it's good to get some terminology down. So I'm just going to explain that first, and then I'm going to show you guys just a little bit of code. Um, it's going to be a little bit of, of strange code, probably for most people, but it should be good. Um, so here's the terminology. Um, we have this thing called a DAG, a directed acyclical graph. The simplest DAG is like two red dots, connected by an arrow, wonderful. So a dot is like a node. Um, a, okay, so a graph is a collection of nodes that are connected together, uh, and it's directed because the arrows have a head, um, and it's acyclical because the arrows don't go round, like you don't get loops in this thing, it's all going in the same direction until the end, um, and that's a DAG. So in, in Airflow land, um, the nodes of your DAG are tasks, and these tasks are executable thingies. Um, so that's, that's the terminology down, easy, right? So, the next part of this, um, well, this definition here, Airflow is a platform to programmatically author schedule and monitor workflows. The programmatically part is the really cool part. Um, so, what I'm gonna show you next is, you can think of it as a configuration file, it's written in Python, but just think config for now. Um, boom. So this is a DAG file. A DAG file is a Python file with a DAG inside it. So once you've got, in, um, you've got, you get Airflow installed, and then you just tell it where you're keeping your DAGs, and it'll go and it'll read all your DAG files, and it'll know about them. So the first thing you do in your DAG file, after your imports and whatnot, is um, you create a DAG instance. So this is kind of like with open blah, blah, blah. Um, you create a DAG. And then inside this context, you create a bunch of tasks, right? So here's a task and here's a task. Um, this first task is a bash task because it's an instantiation of this thing called a bash operator. And when you have a bash task, you can t just send it a bash command and it'll do that, right? So any, anything that you can run on your computer through bash, you can run with Airflow as a scheduled task. So that's quite cool. Um, and then we've got a Python task over here. Um, and that just calls, like, it's got a Python callable, right? So a Python callable, what's that? Usually a function. Um, you can send it a class as well. Where's this function defined? Wherever you want. So you can just like, like it could be here, and that's all right. You can say like def, clean it, um, et cetera. And then you just reference that function from within, when, when you create your, your task. Um, the other thing to notice is that when you create your DAG, you give it a name. When you create a task, you give it a name. Um, this DAG name needs to be unique amongst DAGs. So if you have a bunch of DAGs in your, in your DAG location, um, give them each a unique name. Um, then if you have a bunch of tasks within your DAG, each of those have to have a unique name within that DAG because it makes drawing the pictures make sense. Um, then the other thing to know is that, um, okay, so we've got the tasks, which are those two, those two little uh, red things. So we've got fetch the data, we have clean the data, right? Over here, we have fetch the data, and we've got clean the data. The next thing we need is the arrow in between them, and that is like that. So, yeah, Airflow is pretty cool because it overloads the bit shift operator that nobody uses anyway. Um, so, <laughs> So you can specify, like, this happens, and then this happens. So you got your task dependencies down, and that's it. Um, so you can get some pretty complicated graphs um, out of this, but nice and simple to demonstrate. So why is this cool? This is cool because it's Python, you guys. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can do really declarative things like I did above. Like that smelt a lot like a configuration file. Like we didn't do anything too fancy there. We were just like, this thing exists, this thing exists, this thing exists, we're done. Um, and a lot of workflow management things um, allow you to do declarative things in, 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 in things like XML. I almost said language is kind of like a language. Um, so, 
Why is Python better? Because um, you can make your DAGs in a dynamic way. So this is something that we do a lot um, within a Muzi. So let's say, for example, we go back um, here, and instead of just w getting like one thing from one place, I've got a list of, of files that I need, and they're somewhere else. I can make a loop that creates tasks on the fly, and then assigns all those tasks as the, as the downstream task for another task. So that's cool. I can create tasks on the fly and, and generate their names on the fly. So what I could do here is just like rename it as like um, something interesting. The file name. <laughs> and then put that in a loop, right? So you can do that sort of thing, and it's really useful because that way your task creation is kind of dry. Um, so that's cool. But you can also parameterize entire DAGs. So um, say, for example, you have some analysis workload that you do often with different data sources and maybe different outputs somewhere else. Um, you can um, create a function that creates a, a complete DAG with its own unique name, blah, blah, blah. Um, its own like tasks that are associated with that DAG. And it's cool. Like this is, this is very doable. And we do it within our own workflows as well. So that's pretty fun. Um, why else is this cool? Let's see. Oh, yeah. OK, I said that one. <laughs> the other thing that's cool is these operator things. So I, I showed you two of them. There's a bash operator, run some bash. There's a Python operator, run some Python. Big deal. There's a whole lot more. So um, yeah, the Python operator is great because you can just give it any old callable. And you can also associate a task with specific arguments and keyword arguments and that sort of thing. Um, your bash operator, we just had like a simple wget there, which um, would result in a 404. Um, but <laughs> what you can do as well is leverage ginger templating to make something um, a lot more I don't know, descriptive and powerful. So that's cool. Um, there's also a branch operator. So remember that like, when you're defining your, your DAG, always think of it as a configuration file. You don't say, like, um, if something, then add this task. Otherwise, add this other task. If, if these tasks are meant to be, um, like, if you're supposed to have that if statement execute at runtime, it has to be inside an operator. And so you have this branch Python operator, um, and that's pretty useful. Then um, you can, the trigger DAG run operator is also really nice. So you can have a DAG that like, spins off some other DAGs, um, which is cool. Um, then you've got the email operator and Slack operator because, yeah, you want to know when it's done and you want to know if it breaks. So it's really nice if it just tells you these things. Um, and there's a whole lot more. And you can make your own. It's pretty easy to make your own. So like, for example, making the triggered DAG operator work. There, there isn't an operator for watching for when a DAG is finished. So for me, like, having the triggered DAG operator is great, but then I need another one to like, watch when it's finished, which is nice. Um, so far, so good. The next thing that's really, really important is just like, how do we interact with this thing? Because, I mean, so far, it looks kind of like a, a magical thing. You just like install it and configure it and leave it alone and just wait for it to email you. Um, not really. There's a whole lot more to it. There's a command line utility, um, which is very, very powerful. Um, you can use that for just making sure that stuff got set up properly, that you haven't made any errors in your DAGs, and you can make it, um, and you can use it for testing things as well. Um, so you can test specific tasks and run them out of sequence and that kind of thing. Um, there's also a REST API, which is experimental, but that's exciting. I think that's going to be very useful when it stops being too experimental. Um, and then, of course, Python, because it's Python. So um, when making my operator that's checked for DAG completion, um, it's, it's quite nice. You can just like import Airflow and then just query it and, and look in the database that it is associated with to see what is going on um, with, with various DAGs. So um, Airflow is, um, it has a database that backs it up. That database you interact is um, interacted with through um, SQL Alchemy models. So how many people have used SQL Alchemy? Yeah, easy. So you can, you can just use that. <laughs> OK, so there was one of those. <laughs> OK. Um, then there's also a web UI, which is pretty fancy. So um, let me actually show you the real thing. So and my Slack messages. 
Oh, uh, wrong one. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the, the Airflow um, UI, which is pretty cool. So you can see I'm just running it on my local machine. And yeah, you, you just go to localhost8080, and it's there, and it's wonderful. Um, and when you land, you get a, a list of all the DAGs that you have. Um, I'm going to go to that one because it looks the most impressive. And so I've been, I've been playing with it locally. Um, this view makes the most sense to most people. So if I go here, you can see I've got this, this DAG that does a whole lot of stuff. These, these were created in a loop, saved me a lot of time. Um, and this is actually two DAGs stuck together um, because I parameterized the DAGs and made them just return tasks, and then I could add those tasks to another DAG. So it's really like robust and cool. Um, if I run the DAG, then these little blocks get um, parameterized, I mean, <laughs> color-coded. So right now, everything's marked as successful, but you can see what's running, what's failed, what's skipped, um, what's, what's up next in the queue, um, that kind of thing. So that's pretty useful. Um, oh, whoa. Let's go up. <laughs> um, yeah, then, so this is the graph view. The tree view is really useful as well because it shows you um, each of these little round things is a task and it shows you kind of the, the order in which things have to happen. So there's like a data directory that gets created and then a sheet that gets downloaded, blah, blah, blah. Um, each of these squares um, is, I'm just gonna make that bigger, is a task run that has happened. Um, so, I've, uh, each of these round things is a DAG run that happened and the status of that DAG run. So you have your entire history of all the runs um, kind of visually here. Um, this thing gets quite wide, <laughs> which is quite nice. Um, and there are ways to filter so that you can look back in time a little bit. Um, what else is really cool is that if I run a DAG and I'm like, crap, it broke, I can go to one of the things that broke, I can click on it and I can say, view the log. and Here's my um, traceback. It'll tell me how many retries. This was like uh, very embarrassing. There was a <laughs> name error. Oh, crap. Um, so that's really, really handy. And there's more to it as well. Like if you have secrets that your DAGs need to know about, you can, you can control those secrets through, um, through this as well. Um, so you can say, oh, I have a, I have a secret key that I, that, so, that I use to interact with Google. Um, and that's awesome and cool. Um, then, um, that's pretty much the front end. Those are the, those are the cool bits anyway. Um, it's just like, it's really nice to be able to just look at it and see what, what's going on. Um, I think the other really, really nice thing about having a front end is it means uh, data lit uh, hmm. So, in, in data pipelining in general, it, it tends to be really opaque to, to business users, right? And as your data-driven organization grows, people, like stakeholders, really give a damn, and they really wanna know what's up. And if you don't have an actual picture of the truth of the data pipeline to show them, it can be really difficult to have meaningful conversations. And so being able to show people, um, like if I go to my recruitment department and I'm like, this is, this, well, I wouldn't show them that one actually. I'd show them this one. <laughs> I'd say like, this is what I coded for you. These are all the different things that, that come in and I can tell them how, how things are named so it makes sense. Um, and they can hover over things and see, oh, when did it start? When did it end? If there's an error, they can tell me about it if they want to, if Slack doesn't first. Um, they can even press the play button, which is really cool. And then I can email them what they need to know. Um, so this kind of puts the power into my users' hands, which is really nice. Um, they can press play whenever they want and they can see like what exactly they're getting to an extent. So it removes some of the um, opaci opacity. It's, it's not as opaque <laughs> anymore. So that's, that's really awesome. Um, like in general, in software engineering, uh, clarity breeds trust. And so more of that, please. Yeah. Cool. So that's the web UI. Wonderful. Um, the next thing to think about is the architecture. So I just showed you the web server. 
And the scheduler is the bit that actually does, that actually like looks at the, the cron-ish schedule and triggers everything that needs to happen. These are independent things. Um, and both of them can talk to this thing called a metadata database. So your data pipelines, you can store your data however you want. Um, your, um, yeah. But um, your metadata goes here, so all your task runs, all your logs, um, all of that stuff goes over here. Um, these guys don't talk to each other. This guy talks to a queue mechanism. So the default queue mechanism is just this local thing, but you can use whatever you, well, not with whatever you want. It's open source, so you kind of can use whatever you want, but the default ones are Celery, Dask, and Mesos, um, which is cool. Um, and you can even have lots of different queue mechanisms. So that's really, really cool because it means that you can, and you can have them living on different computers. So you can be running thousands of DAGs at a time and it's actually okay. Because even though this is a bottleneck, it doesn't really like work too hard. Um, if it falls over, it's a big problem though. So you, you should look at it. Um, yeah, and then how do we deploy it? We do it with um, like a really simple looking uh, Docker Compose file, and I'm going to skip that, um, and that's it. Does anybody have a question for me? And you can get this, it's got links on it if you want. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shana. Questions? Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Just uh, at Omuzi, how, I, I mean, we saw examples on the web UI of how this thing worked, but how much time did that save you? How many things did you uh, collapse into one, you could call it, project? So you had bash scripts lying around, Python scripts mm. lying around, and all the such. It saves us time quite often, actually. So initially, it was a bit of a push to move everything over to port it into something. Um, but we had two options. We could either port it into something that was opaque and very, very dev friendly, or we could use a tool that has all these extra things in it. So like there's, there's an initial cost to moving stuff into a new platform, but um, so far it's been very nice because when the data is required, it's just like press play and then the um, recruitment team has what they want. Um, so it saves time and adds clarity like ongoing, yeah. Last quick one before someone asks. <laughs> um, at the, right at the start of the presentation you mentioned uh, when data changes, things break. So how does Airflow solve that? Um, well, it gives nicer logging, so that's one thing. Um, when data changes, things break. Um, so if your input data changes shape, that's quite a big deal. And we can't really solve that beyond having clarity into how it broke. So having that clarity is really nice and saying it broke over there in that red thing. Um, that's, that's quite nice. Um, beyond that, um, having yeah. retries is good because sometimes that is just the issue we yes. need to try again. Um, but yeah, just the being able to monitor it means that we can react quickly to breakages. And also you don't need a dev to actually monitor it. Yeah, yeah. That also helps a lot. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sweet. Hi. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, but that was really, really interesting. I think everyone can relate to you know, all, all these kinds of issues. Uh, f from a day-to-day -day delivery, and like it's building your DAGs and the jobs and, and experimenting and playing, and what's the, the move between from like on your own machine onto production? How, uh, I mean, are these DAGs and these files like shipped and deployed onto the box that's gonna be running the coordinator? Or what's, the, what's that whole process okay. like? Um, so we have this, um Docker compose file, right? And we just run it. Um, so we have Nginx, it lives behind Nginx. Um, we talk to like a Postgres database. Um, and then we run the web server and the scheduler also in Docker containers. So that's that handled. And then the Docker containers have a volume and that volume points to a place on disk. That place on disk is a GitHub repo. So whenever we want to push changes, they just need to be pulled into that repo. And then Airflow is aware of those changes. So yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Um, so we don't have continuous integration built with this yet. Um, so right now it just means somebody has to get into the box and go get pull. Um, and that's it. 
yeah, yeah, just it notices. You can make it notice faster um, because it's got its own schedule for picking up changes, but um, so far it hasn't been a problem. Awesome, thank you. Um, over here. Uh, to your right, okay. So um, there's all these steps that you do in code. Um, is there a, any defined mechanism by which you can push something to a person to do it? Um, I didn't see anything, but I'm assuming there should be kind of a, a CV comes in, you do a bunch of automated things, then someone mm. classes it, and then it goes some other direction, or maybe a sales pipeline even, where there's a technical component to it. This could be very handy to drive it. Do you know of anything? Um. I can, I can imagine this being used like that. I think you'd have to write some custom stuff. So maybe um, you can dump some data somewhere that's human friendly and then monitor something else in a task. Um, there are other ways to trigger a DAG as well besides on a schedule. So there's a button um, and there's an API call as well. Um, so you could like set up something else external that triggers a new DAG. So that's doable. Um, <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool, all the way over here, on the far side. Hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, um, because you're bundling um, Airflow into Docker, most, most people I've seen who do that use a, an image called the Puckle image. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've encountered that, but if you had, have. Why, why didn't you just kind of go with that? Uh, because uh, it was using an older version of Python than I was, so I wanted a new one. Right, so cool. this is actually based on the Puckle image. Um, but it's just like a little bit like more modern. I think they were running three point, I don't know, but we, we wanted to do 3.7. All right, cool. And, and then the other question um, related to Airflow um, and Puckle um, is that, so Airflow you're running is, is 1.x, right? Um, have you taken a look at the, the version two branch at all? And do you have any comments on that if you have? Oh, I haven't. Um, this is, I think 1.10, I think when you pip install 1.10 arrives, so. Yeah. Is the two branch stable? No. Okay. I that's <laughs> yeah. I just went with the with the default there. All right. Cool. I assume the two branch will have some good stuff because they are like, so you you can have DAGs with sub DAGs in in Airflow one, but they like aren't really nice to work in at all. Um, so I assume two would fix that, but I haven't looked at it yet. Any more questions? In terms, in terms of sandboxing, do you need to be careful yourself of not overwriting the same file from, say, like, two parallel nodes, or is uh, the platform taking care of everything and making sure, like, uh, different nodes and different DAGs don't, uh, well, kill each other's work? Okay. Um, so you mean tasks should sandbox from each other? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. I haven't had to do a lot around secrets and secret management in Apache just because our workflows aren't really that sensitive. Um, and so, like, we don't really, like, our use case, we don't mind. Um, but it does have a robust secret management system. Um, and that's cool. Like, you can say that uh, a secret is only available for a specific DAG. And so, if you wanted to sandbox stuff, what you can do is have a DAG that, like, you might be able to make it. Also, like specific to a task, but I'm not sure. If you can do that, then that's wonderful. If you can't, then um, what I would do is just like make another DAG, and then tr like is the the really sensitive DAG that wants to be sandboxed, um, and that's associated with specific t secrets. And then this DAG can trigger that DAG, but it can't look at its secrets. Um, yeah, but yeah, there's, there's, there might be like a, a nice tool that already exists. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, it sounds awesome. Keen to play with it. Uh, operationally, have you had any issues? Not really. Like, it's literally just Docker Compose up, and um, yeah, we the authentication is kind of annoying. So we just use Nginx authentication because not that many people need to interact with it. Um, so that part um, is a bit like we're, we're we're not doing it that great. Um, but everything else seems fairly straightforward. Cool, we have time for one more question, if they say. Who wants to work at a Muzi, you guys? Come on. Oh, um, we're looking for primarily a senior web dev and a senior Java developer. I don't think there are any Java developers here. Um, <laughs> no, but if you have a friend. <laughs> 
Um, my question is if you have a plan for writing and running unit tests for your DAGs, because we also use Airflow at work, mm. but this is something we haven't addressed very well. So in terms of building out our CI to actually run tests for new DAGs, we don't really have a plan. Okay. Um, well, considering that specific tasks can be linked to specific Python callables, you can, you can test those, so that's cool. But a larger data pipeline is a bit hard. So what you could potentially do is have some kind of set input and then expect a specific output. Um, another thing that I've seen with just like um, Panda stuff is if you have a pipeline and like if you have some, some like data wrangling that happens and you know that it works, but it's a giant mess because it was written by data scientists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> then what you can do is you can say, with this input, I expect this output, and then you can change the in-between bits and refactor, refactor, and just like keep running it through through your test. So that's those are kind of the options that I'm that I can think of right now. Cool. Uh, that's <laughs> the time we had for questions. Thank you so much. Yeah? <laughs> Rock on. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.